like to call the, to order the district at Chatwin This Council meeting is meeting. being recorded. Okay, thank you. Uh, February 22nd, 2020 at 4.30. Uh, I will call to order and we'll have the opening statement read. As we gather today on the traditional territory of the Treaty 8 Nations to conduct the business of the District of Chetwin, we do so knowing that we are privileged to serve the citizens of this community and we shall endeavor to conduct our business in their best interests. Thank you. Thank you. Any new items to add to the agenda? New business? Not hearing any? Adoption of the agenda. So moved. Second. Second. Councilor Weisberger. And seconded by Councilor Day. <coughs> Minutes. Minutes of the regular council meeting held on February 7th, 2022. Motion to receive. Second. Any omissions? All those in favor? Carried. Any opposed? Okay, carried. All right, let's get on to uh, delegations. Dan Golub, Fire Chief, 2021 uh, Chilton Volunteer Fire Department update. Good afternoon, Dan. Your Honor, uh, There we go. Thank you. It's all brand new. <laughs> all the cameras and <laughs> um, yeah. Kevin was this supposed to presently show up on this one as well yeah it's not on the screen no, though. That's fine. That's the camera. okay okay um, okay what I'll do is I got a bit of a presentation I've uh, incorporated a um, report that you had an opportunity to review so I thought I would just quickly summarize some of the events that we went through last year. Um, 2021 was my first full year with uh, the district and the fire department, so it was um, it was a really good learning curve to see where the department was and um, learn the area as far as um, our fire protection area. Um, we've had some interesting calls through my first year. I can say that I can chalk up another career fire in my uh, in my 29 years. So um, when we're looking at last year, we had 142 calls and these statistics are um, done through our North Island 911 dispatch. So I thought we could see some of the things that we were, you know, what we attended lots to is that we had 55 MVIs or road rescue calls um, throughout the year and then um, we had about 30 alarms ringing. So alarm ringings is just uh, general alarms, either residential or commercial, that the fire department goes and deals with. And the majority of the times they, you know, false alarms, um, false activations, um, small um, smoke detections within the hallways and stuff like that. So, and you can see that we had a variety of different calls throughout the year that we deal with right from those MVIs, we had a couple of car fires, we had some rubbish fires, um, we had some log sort fires, and um, and so when those we had a couple of public service, so those are just kind of a general overview overview of it. Um, when we compare ourselves regionally, um, we got 142. Uh, we ranked about third, just one ahead of uh, our neighbors uh, to the south of us, Tumbler Ridge. So it's a little bit of bragging rights for us. Um, but it's interesting to see that, you know, Fort St. John and Dawson Creek are both career departments and they have a greater population dictating their um, their call volumes, right? So, but it was good to see that we're comparative and busy, especially with our road rescue that, um, that adds our, to our numbers. 
And then we started having a little bit more um, medical lift assist um, with uh, BC Ambulance as well because of their staffing um, issues. And then they went to a 24 hour car just in the latter part of the year. So we were complimenting them um, when needed after that. If you guys have any questions as we go through this, please just um, let me know and I'll try to answer as we go. Yeah, I have one. I'll start off. I just, on the first slide there, your BCAS assist, is that BC Ambulance? BC Ambulance. So you only had nine the whole year? For lift assist, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So we're not a first responder department, so we don't respond to any medicals as far as um, routine calls. Mm -hmm. So because the department isn't situated for medical response, all we go to is for BC Ambulance lift assist. So we're dealing with some customers that just need a little extra help out of the house and stuff like that and into the ambulance, right? Especially through the winter conditions and slippery slopes and stuff like that. Um, in the latter part of the year, we did get a couple extra calls for um, requests for, um, for emergency assist. So that means generally that if they have a cardiac arrest and they have only two people are on the car that they request additional um, staffing from the fire department if we're able to muster some of that in. So, yeah. yep. With the um, the alarms we had discussed uh, earlier last year in regards to uh, repetitive alarms, has, there, has that issue been pretty much cleaned up or? Yeah, once we were- of small false alarms actually. Yeah. That one, that isolated issue, and we were able to implement that uh, bylaw that uh, um, gave us the ability to start enforcing uh, repetitive offenders uh, worked well because after we were able to get that bylaw in place, that individual was able to get their, their stuff in order. And for the majority of the alarms that we go to, they're, they're spaced over a period of time in which they're not repetitive and they're not for the same issues. The issue that brought that bylaw forward was site specific to a business that wasn't prepared to deal with um, their security system. Um, and so once they were able to get that rectified, then that isolated that issue at two o'clock in the morning. So I have one more question. Um, the um, MBI um, incidents are, 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 are quite high, they're quite significant, and I understand the uh, the necessity for them, uh, for the fire department to go out, um, and they, they, I would su suspect they travel outside of our um, fire protection boundaries for those, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Yeah, and now is there, I'm just curious, I'm not sure, is there any compensation come back from? Yes, there is. For, okay, there is. For yes. Yeah. So well, the way it works is that Emergency BC uh, has a road rescue um, component to their response. And so anytime we go outside of our fire protection area to deal with a road rescue for extrication or BC ambulance uh, assist as far as over the embankment or whatever the case may be, then based on the time that the truck leaves the hall to the time the truck comes back to the hall, um, we are able to get an allotted um, time limit on it. And so it reflects the longer the duration, the, the greater the um, compensation for it. Thank you. Okay. So one of the things to just keep in mind that we're, we respond 24-7, 365 days, um, and it's unique for a volunteer department because we're asking uh, our guys to come and gals come out um, when they're available to respond to these calls. And so one of the interesting statistics that we're, we look at is that when does we have the most frequency for alarms or for an incident? So. We can see that between one uh, or two o'clock and three o'clock midday, we had 14 calls out of that 142. So it kind of helps us to gauge uh, where we are. And then the next one is around 1800 to, to 1900. So six o'clock to seven is usually dinner time. And so we have cooking incidents, right? The smoke detector goes off residentially and stuff like that. And then we have lots of people in transit. So 
you know, the one that's between two and three, it's interesting because we have a broad scale of incidents through that, um, you know, from alarms to MVIs to structure fires um, within that timeline. So, but it's good to have a look at where we're, you know, when we're drawing on our resources as far as the volunteers and then helps us with staffing because in the middle of the day, it's really tough to get um, our staffing because most of the people are all working. And so that we just need to have a keep an eye and, and be conscientious of what we can do for manning a truck during that period. So through the year we had a couple of challenging fires and stuff like that and unique. Um, so the West Fraser log sort fire um, probably was the most substantial fire that we've had for, for a spell. So. Um, when we arrived on scene, it was fully evolved into a lot, um, log sort pile, and then we had heavy winds prevailing on it. And then the next thing we were there for the next 22 hours, working with industry, um, our neighboring mutual aid departments, so that we were able to contain that fire to the log sort yard and protect the, the mill and the surrounding area there. Um, so that was, I think we had six mutual aid departments. We had um, the community show up on the doorstep with water trucks and um, we had industry as far as uh, oil and gas show up with their wildland um, firefighting equipment. And then we had BC forestry um, wildfire on scene as well. And so we had aerial support as well, helicopters. Um, but the unfortunate thing is, is that when that fire grew as the size of it did, there didn't matter what we did to try to mitigate um, the progression of the majority of the loss. We just tried to maintain what we could from jumping another barrier, right? So, and so I had to issue a, a Officer Fire Commissioner fire report and we estimated the loss around $7 million on that. So um, I contacted Wes, Fraser representative and they said that that was a fair amount to agree to. They didn't give me a number, so I figured that that's so it'd be. Um, then we were requested from the regional district then um, the Office of the Fire Commissioner to participate with uh, uh, a wildfire interface at Mount uh, Lamore, um, just west of town here. Yeah, just one question on that uh, sawmill log yard fire. Uh, Post, did we learn anything from that when uh, we were dealing? Because you dealt with multiple uh, uh, people attending the fire, like districts and uh, wildfire and industry. W was there anything that came out of that? That because we have a, a sawmill in town here, so if we have something going on that a little bit different here. Uh, with our uh, mill in town, if that was here in town, we'd have a different uh, scenario going on. So, can we take some of what we learned over at uh, West Fraser to what we need to know uh, right here in town, Dan? Well, we had the opportunity after the fire to debrief with the RCMP ourselves in West Fraser and Canfor. Um, and so, we had some of the conversations that came up from what we could do differently and better. Um, were the command structure, setting up a unified command, having a stationary command post. Um, because in the initial couple hours we had the community show up on the doorstep with all the water uh, trucks, um, lots of support. We had a lot of staff from um, uh, West Fraser there as well, and then ourselves, and then in, and invited some and the fire departments thereafter. So it was about control of that manpower and you know getting control of that so you know you're 100 percent correct that uh, the if we had a similar fire in town here um with canfor we could still anticipate the same kind of prevailing winds the same dynamics but we have an industrial center behind it so we'd probably be inviting um, our mutual aid departments sooner because we have that infrastructure that we would have to um, safeguard we probably allocate those neighboring trucks to be patrolling that industrial site um, you know, we identified that we need to do some more on-site practice 
so that when we arrive on scene we know where the hydrants are that our hose is compatible with their hydrants and um, working with our partners to facilitate a successful mitigation of the problem right so with the, the wildfire interface, there was, uh, there was a handful of structures that were um, destroyed because of the fire. Um, we were at the latter part of the, well, I shouldn't say the latter part, but we were already engrossed in the province burning up with all the resources being allocated to the south. Um, and so when this came in, there was, uh, there was limited resources to get on that fire uh, in, a, in a prompt fashion. I think they brought some of their team from the Tumbler fire up here to manage the, the Mount Lamore fire as well. And so when we got the call, we were asking for resources, what we could take. Um, I believe we were, we looked at, we sent a brush truck to start with, and then we swapped that brush truck out with a, a water tender. And that stayed and supplemented the, um, the structural protection units that were on the remaining structures. Um, and then I was in company with that tender so I knew that if something else was arise, we'd make good decisions on how we were gonna deal with it. And I was the first hand contact with BC um, Wildfire to relocate industry to come and sub us off to release us so that we can return to the community. So there was, I think another five communities, um, Fort St. John, Hudson Hope. Um, I don't think Dawson sent anybody, um, I think, Moberly had some people out there as well. So there was it was another unified mutual aid um, um, event, right? So and then when we're talking about some of the 55 different type of MVIs, those range from single vehicle rollovers to uh, multiple vehicle um, collisions. The picture that's on the slide is involved with uh, one of our um, transport logging trucks that on another wonderful condition day that it um, didn't make a, a corner, right? And so those are the type of events that we were dealing with um, from extrication of patients, multiple patients to even um, small MVIs involving um, motorcycles or ATVs, right? So we responded to a, a broad variety of incidents. Yep. Um, just uh, with the uh, water tender going out to, to the uh, to the Mount Lamori fire, I understand like there was departments from all over uh, the area, and we'd like to thank them for starters for helping out. But with the water tender out there, then it, it puts us in a in a bit of a situation for our for our fire protection area for having a water tender nearby. And I'm just wondering at, at a point like that, what do we do? Like do we or do we um, call a local water truck and have him stand by at the fire hole, or how do we how do we go about mitigating that having that, the the truck out there with all the water? On? Well, it was one of the things that we were totally um, you know cognizant of is getting ourselves replaced with someone else as far as a, an industrial water truck, um, and wildfire was part of that conversation. So. Um, you know, like the way I, I weighed it out, I, I talked to um, Carol first and then, you know, discussed what we were able to do and how we were going to be able to respond to it. And then I looked at the distance in which we were traveling. Um, because of the fire, when I got on scene that day, I, could, I weighed the, the, the risk that was there and we were carrying a full tank of water for 90% of the day. So if we did get a call, we were going to be able to respond back to wherever the incident may occur. And I felt that, I was confident that we would be able to achieve that because we would be able to call for mutual aid from Moberly for tender support as well, um, and then move forward from there, so. So there would have been enough time to respond from, say, there up to Wabi in that. Well, I was looking at the closest portion as, uh, as Doki, right? So, you know, like in, in hindsight and, and, and those type of variables, um, you know, those kind of decisions um, in the future could be weighed a little bit differently. 
And uh, just a point that uh, our A1 uh, firefighting support request for we will be dealing with uh, some of those matters in that and we will uh, discuss them at that time. But uh, any questions that are open to Dan is fine. So uh, just pointing out that we are uh, we have it on our agenda. So operationally, um, we had five members be acknowledged for their long-term service. Um, we're trying to, I think tonight, finally get their awards to them. Uh, I've got a uh, request out to the provincial government and federal government for their ribbons and medals, which takes a bit of time to get in. And you can only apply for it when the last guy is qualified, so they do one kind of order for it. Um, so then once that's done, we'll be able to present those those uh, individuals to mayor and council and chambers here to receive their, their medals and ribbons. Um, one of the things that we developed in, in the department over the course of the year is using the QR codes. So what that is is that we're identifying these codes and they have a link to their forms. So when we get back and we do a post trip on the trucks or we do our SCBA checks after use, then the firefighters are able to just use their um, phone um, and use the camera, it picks up the, the code and then it goes directly to the form. So they're able to use their form, uh, use the, their phone instead of having to go get a binder, paper, chase that around. So it just added a little bit more convenience and a little bit modernization to the way we do things. So it's uh, working well because um, all the emails come back to my office and then I'm able to input that information into our RMS system. Um, we had the Rural Fire Protection Agreement completed and signed in the latter part of 2021, which is good. Um, I know that we acquired the transfer station on top of the hill as well as part of our protection agreement. So that's uh, good and we'll be able to work with them as mitigating some of the hazards that we identified from last year. So, which is positive. Um, because of COVID, we haven't had an opportunity to get out and do much for uh, fire inspections. So in the latter part of 2021, we got into the schools, we got into the community center, and now in the new year, we're starting to hit, get up onto the grocery stores, the pharmacies, and we're starting to get into our, our rhythm for inspections. Yeah. And then some of the new equipment that we were able to um, purchase was we were able to um, piggyback on the fire chiefs uh, association had a grant for some new extrication tools that they had grant money for we weren't uh, we didn't make the grant but we were able to get the same pricing so we were able to still get uh, new spreaders new cutters um, a new power plant hoses and still maintain our existing set of tools for our spare set so that we can set it up on, a, on another apparatus if we get a second call um, and we're still working operationally to try to get that to happen. Um, we got a grant for some wildfire um, personal protective equipment so we were able to get a grant for $10,000 which we were able to buy lightweight helmets, um, masks, goggles and then some shrouds. And then we were able to get a 500 gallon um, porta tank so that we're able to use with our brush truck if we need to have a, um, a portable um, pond so that we can draft out of. And then we can also use that for our training for pump and drafting pack practice. And then we bought another little um, Honda um, portable pump so that it's small lightweight that we can carry it up the uh, slopes, find a creek and then push water onto the fires. And then we also purchased um, and fitted two new full kits for medical for the engine and for the um, rescue. So now we have a full medical kit that's up to date with O2. So if ambulance delayed, at least we're able to have the proper tools to mitigate some of the um, problems with uh, the patient. So those are a couple of things that we got. We also took possession of, uh, we were given a grant for $10,000 for a forceful entry tool. Um, so we got this great big steel door um, that will, fire guys will be able to go and use the halligan and, and the axes on it and pry it and, and as good firefighters, we'll be able to try to break it. So it took a forklift to get it into where it is. 
So I wish them the best of luck on it. So uh, once we get some training on that, we'll get some pictures and we'll bring it back to council to show you guys. Yeah. Yeah, uh, before we go uh, any further, uh, I'd just like to know about the cutting tool. Uh, how old was that? Which is this, sorry? Uh, you talked about the cut cutter. Yeah, the power picture. plant. Yeah. Yeah, the, our extrication tools were fairly are fairly old as well as some of our other equipment. But, but the, the power plant was actually 21 years old. Okay. And so the cutters were probably at least 10, uh, 10 or 12 years old for the spreaders and cutters. So they're still, they're, they, they get service and maintenance every year, so they're good for a spare set. Um, now the, the port of power that we have, um, it takes one person to pick it out of the truck and put it out, converse to having two people lug themselves to getting it uh, curbside. Oops. Um, so with that in mind, they've, that's, uh, and I upgraded the tools as well. So our spreaders spread wider, they have more spreading force and our cutting cutters are, they can open up wider and they can shear with more strength. So I upgraded them one model so that when we're dealing with tractor trailers that are on the side, that we have the tools that should get in and uh, mitigate what we need to do with it. Yeah, that's great because uh, 44, I think it's 44%. We deal with vehicles. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, uh, with the training, I just would like to know about the training. Do we send anybody out to get trained? And uh, if we do, where do we send them? Well, unfortunately, the last two years because of COVID, yeah. everything's been kind of on the kibosh. Mm -hmm. So right now, we've uh, for this year, we're bringing in a hazmat operations course that's sponsored through the IFF. And so it's a free course that um, will go for certification to um, complement our NFPA 1001 um, firefighting certificate training that we're doing. So that's, a, that's huge and we've opened it up to our neighboring departments because they need to have 20 to 25 uh, participants. So currently we have 20, well we have 25 people and 12 of them are our, our own members that can make it themselves available for that, that weekend. So generally, if we for extrication, we bring a subject matter expert to us, so that we can maximize our membership on that instruction. And then, if we have to send people away, so what we're trying to work with right now is uh, developing some live fire instructors, so that we can send our crews to Dawson Creek to use their live fire facility there. And then we're not solely dependent on utilizing their crews if they're not available and then slowly work into a system so we can't send too many people at one time so our goal is if we have three to four people Moberly has three to four people Tumblr has three to four people now we can send enough people to the Dawson Creek facility and run evolutions because that's what you need for numbers okay thank you so I just have a follow-up question on that so this have the core hazmat course that you're looking at putting on if you don't get enough attendance to it would you be able to go to um, like corporations like I know Pine River Gas Plant has a small fire group there that would they be able to take part in this to make your numbers up or would you invite people like that to that I'm not sure about industry but I know that uh, when I was on uh, the email today with uh, the organizer they um, said that we can open up the ambulance or our CMP oh, okay. to fill those those voids so I canvassed the region to see who was interested and I got the numbers to balance out to make a commitment to bring it. So we'll be hosting that at the um, community rec center in one of their meeting rooms so that we meet the COVID spacing um, and stuff like that. Um, so last year we had the opportunity to have uh, actually a live, uh, a live fire. Um, uh, one of the neighbors in our fire protection area had a um, old dwelling. It was a side-by-side -side trailer that um, he wanted gone. So we, I'm always very conscientious of what we're burning because you know everybody wants something burned really is in disarray and very unsafe for us to be in, right? So um, this might be the last one I do because 
you know, like it's just too much stuff that goes around that can go wrong. And I try to get it in early enough the season so that I don't cause the neighborhood to go somewhere else that it's not supposed to because of our arid ways. But this was a prime example of, of some of these pictures that you see on the, on the PowerPoint is that it gives an opportunity for our, our brand new firefighters to have a look at what a cold start is. And so that's what that left hand picture is, is that we lit up a fire and then we can show them the dynamics of how the thermal line comes down and then see how the smoke works and how they have to react to the different environments. And so that's all controlled. We have hoses, we have backup teams, we have everything that in there. And you can't really replace that kind of training um, unless you go to a, a fixed facility, right? And so again, we had an opportunity to do some uh, um, hand line uh, evolutions, uh, exposure evolutions, and it taught our young guys and some of our middle people that haven't had an opportunity because my day, we cut our teeth on fire because it was just a different time frame. Now we have better, we have a better protection, we have better um, building, we have everything that's in place that reduces the amount of fires that we attend. So this was a really good opportunity for these guys to get some hands on. So when we're looking at some of these statistics, <clears throat> because my first year was to see and evaluate our department to see exactly where we're gonna go. We need to meet an exterior level. We need to meet the playbook standards. Um, and we're working with our training partner, Vieira, which is uh, Vancouver Island Emergency Response Academy. So they've got a system that's online. We're working to get our guys uh, with their exams, their evaluations. And so, you know, we had 106 total training sessions. Um, we had an average of uh, seven people per uh, event. So we had almost 1,500 hours of training last year. So that incorporated our, our, our probies and our, our regular guys. And then that included some eight hour extrication courses that we were able to utilize uh, Robert's towing. And as well as um, when we had some um, longer days as far as the, the days get longer, we can push a little bit for an extra half an hour, an hour here. So um, it was just, um, it was a, it's a good illustration to see the dedication of the volunteers and their commitment to the department by the hours that they put in. And so one picture shows over the bank rescue. So that's one of the things that we do for uh, assisting someone on a road rescue. On the bottom is a firefighter survival. So there's a firefighter that's connecting what's called a rapid intervention bag. What that is, it has a spare um, air bottle in there. And so he makes a connection so that it equalizes his bottle while they extricate him out the building. And then I think the other one on the back, I'm not really sure, I can't see it. Um, and so again, we spent a lot of time with extrication. Uh, again, another opportunity for me to evaluate where we were, what we need and what we need to do as far as tools and then training. Um, and then I was able to offer a few new suggestions. A couple of unique situations here is that Robert Stowing has a great relationship with the fire department. So we give them a call, they open up their yard. So whatever they got there, it's like, it's like, you know, someone in a sandbox. So we were fortunate that one day they had actually, uh, one of the 40 person, um, transport buses and we were able to lay that on its side. And that was a good illustration because we have all these buses running around to the mines, industry, the pipeline, school, and letting our guys get some hand on time, cutting into those things and understanding what the tool can do with what's inside that bus to make a hole for it um, is indispensable, right? And so that was really good. They, we, we spent eight hours cutting apart that bus and there's no right or wrong but there's a, a best practice. And we give the opportunity for you to come up with an idea. You take the tool, you go and make a cut. Then we let someone else try something different. And then everybody can see hands-on what's going to be the best way. So at least they have something in their toolbox when it's 40 below and they got to get a guy out in rapid fashion. So, you know, big kudos to Robert's towing. 
um, we're reaching out to them. I'm going to get something made up in acknowledgement of their, their um, kind donations to us. And uh, keep us in mind, give Carol a call and uh, make sure that staff is making us aware of uh, what you're contributing or deciding to contribute to uh, Roberts because uh, as volunteer fire department, uh, it's citizens and uh, I class uh, our area where we have our fire protection area as citizens of Chetwin because we protect them and uh, if Roberts is doing quite a good service, we'd like to be participants in that. Uh, thank you. Yep. Um, if there's any, if, if, if Mayor Council wants to be privy to come and watch any of these training evolutions, please let me know and I can certainly extend the invitation because it's well worth seeing what, uh, what your decisions are enabling us to do with new equipment and, um, and, um, and trucks. And so last year was our initial um, recruitment. We had, uh, we had four people, one person met uh, personal um, obligations were too great to stay with the department, but we had three people that stuck together. Um, they are probably 80% through their 1001 right now. And the hazmat will complement that certificate on the side that they need. And then we've just taken on um, another two, uh, which we started off four, but unfortunately again, when people get in and get a little bit of time, time is our enemy with the volunteer service right now is that there's only so much time we can get from everybody. And so we do our best to try to keep them, but the two individuals that are with us right now, oh, actually three, sorry. We have three probies right now. Um, they're just getting through their three month um, period. And so now we're gonna be able to get them onto the floor responding to, um, to calls and they'll be mentored on the scene with, uh, with a firefighter. So we got protocols situated so that you know, not everybody gets on the truck and then it's overloaded with probies. We got one on a time. And then when it's like serious MVIs, we'll, we'll work them in as their time progresses because we don't want to expose them to too much too soon because it, they're just not prepared for some of the things that unfortunately we have to see in the job. But great success so far. So again, me taking over, um, looked at some maintenance stuff, I, uh, our annual apparatus maintenance. So annually we have to have uh, the, um, the fire trucks um, pump tested and the valves and everything maintained. So I brought in a new company this year. So they had a completely different set of eyes on it. Um, and so we were quite successful. And then they had some, those pictures on the bottom is actually them doing pump testing. So they have a pump test kit that they bring. They open up the pot, uh, port of tanks and then they just cycle water. And then that thing has to run X number of hours to meet their certification and the requirements within the NFPA. So that was good. Um, last year was really good for me because I was going through all the inventory in the hall. So we hit our five year cycle on SCBA bottles. So every five years we have to go get them hydrostatically tested. So that meant I have to go and touch every bottle that's in the hall, figure out where it is and, and its date, um, number it, take it to somewhere else, get it serviced. Hopefully they service it in a timely fashion, bring it back. Um, but we've got 95% um, we of those bottles all cycle because they, they come out every five years. And then um, our auto extra tools, we have, uh, a company that comes in annually and just services the tools and then as well as our SCBA um, breathing um, cascade system so when we get back to the hall we have a machine that refills our bottles and that apparatus needs to get maintained every year and we have annual air um, quality testing that happens at the same time so so all of that was up to snuff and good to go and then I was introduced to Community Fireworks this year, which is great. Um, I know that our fire guys really enjoyed setting the displays off previously with, with a stick and a flare and, and, a, and a wink and a, and a wink. Um, we were given uh, the opportunity to upgrade our fireworks system. So um, in conjunction with Star uh, Light FX, they were able to situate us with uh, new mortars that were um, packaged. Uh, what you see on the bottom there is modules. So the modules fire site-specific mortars. And so then what you see is more orchestrated. So we can time delay it from two to 
however long you want the delay of the fireworks. So we range from four inch mortars to two inch and the shows that you guys witnessed were a product of that. So um, I think that was one of our fireworks that one of our um, neighbors took for us. That was, uh, I have to reuse it because it's the best picture we can find, right? Because it's awesome. Um, but you know, like standing curbside uh, with this and those four inch mortars, oh boy, you feel that concussion, right? So I feel a lot better knowing that we've got our fire guys back on a perimeter and we're just dealing with some of the stuff that uh, uh, from the outfall from it. So a lot safer for our members and the public. Um, we we're fortunate that we got at least one or two hall tours through last year under our COVID restrictions and stuff. I think it was just when we lightened the, the, the spike that we were able to have some kids through. And it's been a long time since I've done a fire hall tour, but man, I missed it. It was great, you know, like the kids and their, their questions, you know, from the dinosaurs to whatever, you know, had no relevance to the big red truck. And um, the firefighter gents and she took some time off of work and came in and she was uh, able to dress up as a, as a firefighter and uh, show the kids that, you know, this is what you can expect if we come and not to be scared, right? Because when they have that opportunity and we have to be conscientious of our gear being clean and, and, and the public and stuff like that, but the kids are really conscious of feeling what a firefighter, because it's scary. You're like, if you're, if you're in a room and mom and dad aren't there and then you see someone big and scary, well, you wanna make sure that you introduce that, uh, that uh, little bit of fear factor lessened um, with this opportunity. So it was great to have them out and we're looking forward to doing more as we get rid of our restrictions. So the membership um, did their annual boot drive. I think they had a miss one year. But this year they were able to go in conjunction with the RCMP and our Argo uh, maintenance to set up our, um, where we're going to be, you know, waving the boot. And um, the membership was able to raise $10,000. So it was a great reflection of the volunteers that made the time to go out and solicit the, the neighbors for a couple of extra dollars. And I think some of them said that uh, some of the travelers um, tipped rather well. And so it's a good reflection on the community as well as what they think of the, the fire department and willing to give a little bit more um, than, you know, what's in your pocket. So it uh, was well done on their behalf and um, we look forward to doing it again, so. Another thing just that uh, on the outset, we're, we're just looking at um, a couple of options for our training rounds as far as where we might be able to facilitate it um, it needs to get a little bit more of a plan and I'm trying to work on the development of that and then try to give a, a, a budget to see where we might be able to go and what we might need and then just look at a couple of different site selections so that we're able to maximize our area as well as if we do it once we want to do it once and not have to come back and try to you know fit space for space to be had so once that gets a little bit closer I believe we're going to be bringing that back to you guys for uh, approval and then um, and moving forward with it so and then if you have any questions get yeah, down uh, your opinion uh, like we have a volunteer fire department how are we doing like give us uh, the goods here because uh, I know you're uh, new here a year so how, how, in your opinion, professional opinion, how are we doing as a volunteer fire department? You know, the, the, the fortunate thing about the, the Chetwin Fire Department is that it has uh, a key group of people, right? And that key group of people are seasoned veterans, right? Like the people that were acknowledged earlier in our presentation, they're individuals that got 25 years to 40 years. And within that, they have uh, an area knowledge. They know what they need to do. Um, and they've seen quite a bit because you don't, you're not in the fire department 40 years and not see bad things happen. And good things as well, right? And I think I'm very confident that with our transition into our NFPA 1001 training, so that we can go from that exterior declaration that we have right now to an interior declaration so that 
now we're able to go into the structures and we're able to mitigate those problems a little more readily um, because right now with our with our six uh, probationary firefighters within by the end of the year we should have them certified and then we have two other people that are going to be certified and we have two existing um, NFPA 1001 people so you're gonna have 10 people you're gonna have one third of the department that are working that way and we've set the foundation now that with our new recruitment that that is going to be the new mode that we're going with and the veterans are, are buying in they're 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 supporting the system and they are participating right um, Brent is sitting behind me um, he is a prime example of a guy that's got a lot of years in and he is one of the guys that's writing exams right he's he's leading by example and um, and that's what we're we're looking for and it's just that transition period um, you know we have our bumps like anyone else but I feel confident that um, if we keep moving in the process we are that we should be in the right place uh, in a short order so did you answer my question <laughs> how are we doing in your opinion are we above uh, normal and higher than that as a volunteer fire department I know you haven't uh, have you been uh, involved with very many volunteer fire departments yeah. You know, like the, where we are, I'm comfortable, right? I know that uh, if I'm on the fire ground scene and uh, the people show up on that fire truck, that if we're, if we're able to do what we need to do to knock that down that fire, I know that we have the capability of doing it, right? It depends on how many fresh faces we have and how many seasoned faces, right? It, it fluctuates. Yes, we are a good sound fire department. Right, and we are capable of doing a lot of things, um, and that's what we're here for. And especially for the the road rescue stuff, like there's no shortage of experience because the majority of the people work in industry, so they're all hands-on people. Um, they're able to think through problems, and that's the biggest thing with our industry is you've got to think through the problem in short order to mitigate it, so that you're able to move on to the next challenge. So. Thank you, Dan. Is that better? Maybe. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. We will continue. Uh, bylaws. District of District of Chetland Official Community Plan Amendment Bylaw Number 1144-2022, 52nd Street Northwest requires third reading and adoption. Move for third reading and adoption. Second. Discussion. These were requested by the owners of the properties. Yeah. No more discussion. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carry. B B two. District of Chetland Zoning Amendment Bylaw Number One One Four Five, Twenty Twenty Two, Fifty Second Street Northwest uh, requires. Third reading and adoption. Motion to receive third reading and adoption. Councilor Galbraith, you second? I'll second, second that. Mill. Okay. Councilor Deck. Discussion. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carry. B3. District of Chapman Highway Closure Bylaw 1. 146 2022 requires first, second, and third reading. I'll um, make a motion for first, second, and third reading. I'll second. Discussion. I have just a question. Now this, goes now, this now goes to public hearing, right? Will it? Beth? It's not an official public hearing, but it's a public input opportunity. Public but input. we'll be advertising and also sending out letters to the adjacent property owners. Awesome. Thank you, Cheryl. 
Okay. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Community reports and liaison reports. Regional district. From the Peace River Regional District, uh, in our board uh, meetings, uh, we were uh, scheduling Magua Clan Energy Cultural Safety Training. It was approved in August of 2020, uh, 2021. Magua Clan Energy, uh, led by Stuart Cameron, former uh, Chief uh, Soto First Nation, and Adrian Lewis. What this entails is adding value, building stronger relations with the PRRD, with the First Nations. Uh, the PRRD <coughs> extends a hand to the First Nations and Indigenous communities towards stronger relations. Uh, the goal for the PRRD is to learn with uh, Marqua clan energy and culture safety with an Indigenous worldview. Uh, the PRRD has finished its uh, first session February 10th, uh, 2022. So with this uh, sitting, sitting with uh, the board and learning uh, to be, it is uh, a business that uh, Stuart and uh, Adrian operate. They go into uh, industry and uh, teach them about cultural uh, <coughs> training and how uh, you deal with uh, the indigenous uh, parties. So either uh, bands or uh, businesses that are indigenous owned. So uh, I found this very, uh, very good for the board. And uh, it was interesting that uh, uh, Stuart uh, Cameron, former chief, has been doing this kind of work for 25 years after uh, leaving, uh, leaving the position as, of chief. So uh, he's got uh, quite the experience doing this. So any questions uh, about this, it's all on the PRRD uh, 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 network, so you can, you can find it there on their webpage. And uh, one uh, point uh, from the PRRD, I know the solid waste, uh, uh, solid waste bylaw number 2463-2021 was adopted that the solid waste regular, this is just part of the, part of the adoption I'm reading here, solid waste regulation and fees bylaw to increase industrial, commercial, and institutional tipping fees by 5% for sorted and 76% for unsorted. Uh, this is to uh, make sure that we have enough landfill for the next little while. So this is one of the things that was recommended by the Solid Waste Committee. And uh, that's my report from the PRD. Any councillors uh, have a re any reports from many uh, committees? Not seeing any uh, from the mayor's report. <clears throat> On uh, February 16th, 2022, the PRRD approved the draft budget for the Chapman Library and the rec recommendation that passed as draft is that the regional board include in the 2022 financial plan the draft 2022 budget totaling Five million eight hundred twenty twenty-eight thousand five hundred ninety-two dollars for function two ninety Chapman Library, which includes twenty-two percent increase in requisition for twenty twenty-one and an estimated tax rate of point one six seven seven per thousand dollars. So that was uh, approved on uh, twenty uh, special budget meeting. So the library is a go, so that that's great, good for uh, Chapman. So uh, yes, very, very exciting. Uh, any discussion on that? Just to uh, have some reflection on what it's been on, going on, I believe for five to six years, I believe. I was on the board, the library board, when it was first introduced. So it's been a while. You've been on it just about four years? Yeah. I would say seven years at least. Yeah. Very good news. Okay, uh, 
administration report? Uh, I don't have one this week, but if I could get a motion to receive your report for information. I would make a oh, second. Okay. Council Weisgerber and seconded by Council Galbraith. Any more discussion? Should I talk more? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Discussion items. Resource Municipality Coalition dated February 7, 2022, request for support, Northern Health Audit. I'll make a recommendation that Council authorize a letter of support be sent to Minister Dix, Ministry of Health, and Premier Horgan requesting an audit of the Northern Health Authority. I would second that. Okay. Council Board moves, seconded by Council Galbraith. Okay. Discussion. Go ahead. So in, is, is this letter going to be from the district of Chetwin? We're not going under their umbrella, right? Uh, what, go ahead, uh, staff? That's correct, because we're not a member of the coalition. No. Yeah. Okay. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Correspondence. Letter from uh, Minister Lisa Baer, a Minister of Citizen Services dated February 10th, 2022, Internet Speed Study, Peace River Regional District. I'll make a motion to receive C1. Second. Second. Go ahead. Any discussion? <coughs> Unreceived, we, do we need discussion? Staff? Hey, I have a question. Ahead, Just, it, how, how will this benefit Chetwin? Or will it affect in any way? No. Thank Counselor, you. I mean staff. Go ahead, uh, Carol. She mentions in the letter that they felt in their in their studies that Chetwin had good internet speed. So it's not really helpful. I'm sorry, Carol, I can't. Oh, sorry. Um, in the letter she mentioned that they, they discovered Chetwin had good internet speed, so I didn't really feel it was very helpful. Is that the council? It's up to council whether or not we want to... Uh, I, I guess, uh, respond? No, I already made a motion to see that. Okay. Okay. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Any items from uh, I-1 to I-5 that we need to lift? Okay. Motion to receive I-1 to 5. Okay. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Okay, uh, reports for action, RA1, Fire, firefighting support at request of other agencies. I would make that motion that council provide administration with direction. Second. Go ahead, staff. Could I ask what the direction yes. is? Well, you could. Um, I think we should probably take each and every case at a, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, every incident, look at it differently instead of not sending anybody. Um, that's not clear. That's not clear to me. No, no, it's not. So I, I believe our uh, fire department and the letters that were uh, received by the PRRD and uh, they were given to all of us and we read them that they want us clearly either we have our tankers sit here yeah. and making sure that the rural is uh, is uh, taken care of, that our fire uh, fire protection area is uh, 
taken care of, mm -hmm. or we decide that it, one, one, this is just uh, coming from myself, if we need another avenue to go to either get another taker, if we think it's uh, going to be effective in helping out with a fire that's dangerous to the population of Chetland and the residents of Chetland. And we send a tanker out there because the fire that was in Mount Memori could have possibly hit Chetland or Mobley Lake where the residents were. Uh, go ahead, Carol. Just a couple of contributing factors were the fact that um, there was an extremely bad fire season down south. So a lot of the resources were already occupied down there. So that's why they invited us one of the reasons they were invited us. And I think it would be very difficult to, to um, get together and discuss the merits of each case. Mm -hmm. Because usually if we're called in, it was a little bit of a, an emergency. Mm -hmm. um, the other contributing factor is that the Mount Memorial Fire was quite a distance away from Chetwin. So it was beyond our rural mm -hmm. fire protection area. So it was an anomaly. It's not something we would usually do. The reason that one of the reasons that we made that decision was because um, other resources were not available at that time, but uh, we went on the understanding that if we were needed back in the municipality, we'd just go. Usually, you have to wait for a release from the BC Wildfire Service, but in this case, they said they would just let us go. Yeah. And another reason is that um, the other municipalities around us were contributing resources, so we kind of felt being that little the Willow Creek mine is actually in district property, that it would be a show of support for, the, for that mine area. But as uh, mayor and council, we have, uh, uh, have our citizens to take care of, and if time is of essence here, then we, we are lacking that time when it has to come from Mount Mori to uh, go east of Chetwin. So we're in quite, quite a predicament whether whether or not we could get to that fire with that tanker. Absolutely. So it, it is uh, something that we, I say I say out east because uh, if we talk about Mobley, Mobley is uh, 25 minutes maybe from town and in between you, you got whoever, uh, but it, it's still still a predicament that we, we would be in and if it's outside our fire protection area, then we have to deal with it and that's where I think uh, direction from council needs to come from. Either that we're going to step up and say our, uh, our tanker sits here and provides protection for our rural area. And if uh, global warming becomes part of our uh, firefighting issue, then we should decide if we need a tanker to help out in that, in that uh, scenario so we we should be thinking about this in the near future if we have to sit as council with our fire department and discuss this matter and maybe bring bring in bc uh, fire and decide what we're going to do because it's quite important that we don't lose anything in our community because uh, as uh, we all seen this year a whole community disappeared and we do not want that to happen Carol? Just one last thing is that in the future, another consideration that's positive is that the new agreement that we've signed with the PRRD includes a new tender. So we intend to keep the current tender and then we'll add that to the fleet. So that will help in the future. But I mean, not immediately because it'll take a while to get that requisitioned. Councilor Deck. As the mayor said, we have, a, we have an obligation to our rural fire protection area and, um, but we also, I think we also have an obligation to our neighbors in, in Hudson Hope for if they, if they need our help, they're, they're quite willing to come down here. Could this, in the meantime, until we get that second tender, is it as simple as having somebody on, like a water truck on call that can be, if there's a fire, it comes down to the station or was every water truck in the province uh, somewhere else? I mean, it, it could be as simple as having a call list we have that for snow, uh, snow removal and so on. I know snow removal is not quite as dramatic as uh, fire protection, but we should have something in place for our, uh, for our rural residents. Do you mean um, private or? Pardon me? Were you talking about a private resource? Yep. Okay. Yeah, just having one to 
come up to the hall and if he, if he charges 120 bucks an hour to sit there uh, in order to protect for the two days that they're out there, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe so be it. Maybe that, that's what we have to pay because uh, we, we do have an obligation to the, the, to the fire protection zone. That's just an opinion. I'm not an expert on fires or anything. But I'd like to leave that to the experts, but I mean, we should have something. Do we need direction tonight? Uh, I don't think so. If you'd like to think it over and, and come back with another recommendation, we're very happy with that. It's winter now, so we're not too worried about fires at this <laughs> right. precise moment. Good. Well, okay. how, how far out is the new tender? How far away? Two, two years. years. Oh, two years. The scheduled replacement for the tender was 2026. Two years is likely when it would be getting ordered, and then you get probably another yeah. year to two before it gets delivered after. So, should we have to buy an old water truck until then? I mean, I, I don't want to. Uh, it, it, it might be sufficient just to make an arrangement with the private hauler to have somebody on like a five minute call in case we needed it, right? Where if we need you, we'll call you, you know, you'll just turn and drop whatever and come straight for this. Yeah. And I believe with uh, private, uh, they, they have their own agenda that they, because they're in business, they're not, yeah. you know, uh, on the whim of uh, Chapman and especially when it's uh, that kind of season. I, I believe they have their own uh, issues with water trucks uh, being away. So I, I believe we should uh, either table this and uh, have a discussion with our fire chief and our fire department, making sure that we're in the right place. And if we do have to get something in place, because two years, three years possibly with an order is a long ways out. So I believe we should be uh, going in that direction if council wishes and uh so i have a question yeah, so ahead, if, if water like if you, even if you got a water truck on standby are they equipped to be able to attach hoses to and fight a fire like i don't i don't know if they are i don't i don't think they are but Can I, so I don't know what you do that to our fire chief I mean, the, having industry on standby, they would simply be a shuttle of water. So we would have to make sure that they have the capability of which they're able to pump water. They're able to come pump water into a um, dump tank that we would be drafting out um, regardless. So one of the things to keep in, we can certainly explore those avenues um, because those are options. But I mean, like I know that at the can, um, West Fraser fire, we had industry trying to supplement our engine and we were having difficulty with it because we have to make sure they they work with a cam lock system and we work with threaded system. And so we would have to make sure that whatever partnership we went into with uh, the company that they were able to facilitate that, right? And then uh, take it from there because then they would just go and push water into our engine that would be on site wherever it is, and then away we go because our our apparatus is simply um, right now is to shuttle water. So it um, we have a small pump, but we don't have the capability of drawing from uh, static static water. So we have to buy a new pump for that and get it reconditioned so we're able to do some of that. That was one of the benefits of participating in that uh, wildfire interface is because we identified where our weaknesses were with that tender. And as um, we identified that, we're in the process of looking at and having a conversation with the fire department now with a new tender as the regional district is picking up the cost of that. And so once we get um, a conversation started, we'll be able to put the truck committee together, design something, and then we'll be able to put it to the regional district for further conversation. And there's a variety of overlaying variables when it comes to the fire service and fire apparatus right now because as anyone knows, industry is going kind of crazy as far as trucks and chassis and manufacturing, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, what's the wish of councils? Shall we table this and uh, 
Uh, I think we need to have a further discussion on it just to find out what some of our options can be. But I think every individual case is going to be different. So, yeah, I, and I agree. But I, and I, but I think in the meantime, like unless we plan on doing it soon, we need to be if something if something happens again, right? We need to be prepared that yeah, like, this trial does uh, not go anywhere. The summer, yeah, and uh, that's when council will we, we'll discuss that and then we'll give direction prior to uh, the summer here mm -hmm. because before fire season uh, picks up. And I think it needs to be done prior. Yeah, and, and you know, it doesn't have to be fire season. There could be a fire at West Bay. somewhere and there could be a house fire. So it, Perfect. it could be any time, right? Okay. So the sooner? The sooner the better, yes. Yeah. Okay. So table till further, uh, do we need to put a time limit on this? Uh, go ahead, Carol. Um, if you wish to put a time limit, sure. I, if I could also get a motion, a table in motion. Yep. I would make that motion to table it for further discussion. Second. So next second. <clears throat> Any more discussion on the table? Okay. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Uh, I guess uh, just some information. I guess uh, uh, the mayor and uh, CAO will give out some dates on when, uh, when we can all meet for this uh, discussion. It's very important one. It is, and, and would we also be meeting with the fire department? Yes, we will, Perfect. We will, we will organize that. Okay, thank you. RA2, purchase of the wheel loader mounted boom mower. I'll make the recommendation that council approve the purchase to Roland since 1946 for the wheel loader mount boom mower as advertised for 151,760 and that the 2022 financial plan be amended accordingly. I would second that. Okay, we got a second discussion. Councilor. Uh, um, how, how did the item go from 110 to 151,000? Staff? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, but when I followed up with the engineering department, it actually was earmarked for 151, and when it went into capital for discussions on the spreadsheet, it was different than what she originally had. So that's the background information I got from Desiree. Okay, finance. Did we pick that up, or uh, are we just I'm, I don't know where the, the change came, but when Desiree submitted her capital budget list to me, it came in at 110 on the list to me. So that's why you guys seen it at 110 and not at the 150. And so something got dropped somewhere along the way, but. Uh, so do we have forty some thousand dollars to make up the? <laughs> I guess that was the, the money. The money it's, question. It's still within the reserve that we can handle it. Yes. Okay. Thanks for catching that, now. I mean, officer. I know. But bring it. Bring it to our attention. Thank you, Anne. It's uh, within our budget that we can. Uh, collect that forty some thousand dollars, right, Councillor Weisker? <clears throat> okay. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Uh, reports for information: January account payable checks listing. Are we going to add that 40000 to this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be corrected. <laughs> I'll make that recommendation that the check, check register for the month of January 2022 totaling $708,379.70 be received. I'll second. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. And there was no new business, public questions.
not seeing or hearing any? Any on the Zoom? Any public? Okay. Adjournment. So moved. Everybody's in favor? Thank you, Council and staff and public.